we're going to look at his work in a kind of loosely chronological order and also kind of make a few kind of observations of London as it kind of was before he arrived and as it was kind of changing while he was active. Uh, so this is the spot in St. Peter's Road where the Beckin, um, if you want to believe him, uh, was convinced to become an architect. He was born in Georgia, which was a colony of Russia at the time, and the spot where the river splits into two, and it was conceived by Peter the Great as the, as the kind of center point of this new capital. And uh, more importantly, it's where the Beckin would come and conceive the alcohol because it's really one of his friends. Uh, he enrolled to the Stroganov School of Applied Art in Moscow. This is his entry for um, admission to the program. It's a, it's a collective dwelling for railway workers. Um, and it's kind of unremarkable except for the geometry of the plan, which is something that he will return to uh, recurrently in his career. Um, and he leaves school kind of the day of the Russian Revolution, quite literally, where the Bolsheviks overthrow the Tsar and turn the country upside down. And he's kind of exposed, and he rubs shoulders in his young adulthood with um, several kind of key proponents, key advocates of the um, of the revolution, including people like Elisitsky, whose artwork is pictured here, where the red wedge of the Bolsheviks is. Um, uh, eating the white who represented the counter revolution hit. And he, he ran into and bumped into these people and they, they formed a, a big impression on him as a student and uh, instilled in him as a series of um, kind of deeply held socialist outlook. And it was a time of the, the kind of birth of the constructivist movement and there was a great deal of interest and energy kind of spent in um, creating a a distinct kind of artistic identity for the revolution. So artists like Rochenko were, were doing artwork like this. Um, people like Tatlin were planning these um, incredible monuments. This one is you know, bigger than the Eiffel Tower and about five or six times as wide. Uh, planned for St. Petersburg in an incredible amount of iron and steel. And he was exposed to uh, revolutions and things like theater as well. So this is a, this is a my old uh, production in Moscow. This is a model by uh, Asitsky of an unrealized my old production, and it, it bears a kind of few striking similarities to the penguin pool that the Beckin designed later. So here he is as a young man, and he he spends a few years bouncing between Petrograd as it was known then and Moscow. And um, he kind of embarks on this uh, quintessential architect's grand tour of Europe. And he spends about 10 years edifying himself and uh, traveling across Europe and gaining his education and his identity as an architect. So he starts in Berlin and he enrolls here at the Textile Academy, where he studies under uh, Wilhelm Goranger, who um, as kind of extremely influential people like Henry Albers, for example, and he kind of explores a, a childhood fascination with carpets and textiles. Um, see here. And he also goes to the Charlottenburg Technical Academy, where he studies under Professor Kirsten, and learns about um, reinforced concrete, all about reinforced concrete, which is a kind of pioneering building material at the time. And it's kind of interesting Set parallel study that he embarks on just over a few months. He doesn't, he doesn't stay long in Berlin. And he moves from there to Warsaw, where he completes the three year architectural program in 15 months. And they tell him there's no more we can teach you, please go off to Paris. And he uh, ends up here at the Palais des Etudes of the Ecole de Beaux Arts. And he kind of takes this burgeoning interest in reinforced concrete. And um, binds it with this atmosphere of Beaux-Arts education in the atelier um, Auguste Perret. And this is Perret's uh, pioneering reinforced concrete apartment block in Paris, the Rue Franklin. 
And it's, it's a kind of perfect um, atmosphere for testing and applying some of the ideas of architectural continuity in these uh, kind of new and raw materials. So he's, he's, he's always got good timing. Um, he arrives in Paris at the moment of the 1925 Expo of uh, Industrial and Applied Arts, I think it's called. Um, and he's kind of struck by two pavilions in particular. I mean, imagine basically a, a bigger extravagant to next be running. The first is Lucier's Pavillon de l'Espirito, it's a pavilion of the living spirit. And um, he is struck by a kind of, what I think he called it, intellectual, calm intellectual superiority that this pavilion exuded. Um, it was a kind of, sort of a prototype model dwelling that could be kind of applied in a modular fashion to form a kind of um, city, effectively. And it's, it was proposed alongside Corbusier's Plan Voisin, which was this series of cruciform towers and accompanying kind of motor of car infrastructure. Um, and it had this kind of free plan. And, um, Ornament and decoration were kind of stripped back to the point of disappearing, and um, it was kind of functionalist in its emphasis through a series of built in furniture and um, other kind of amenities for, to support the kind of modern lifestyle that was being advocated for. He also bumps into this, um, which is the Soviet pavilion by Melnikov, um, and he actually spent a bit of time doing some uh, translation between the construction crew and the expo team. And this is a kind of radically different proposition. Um, and it's kind of in line with the, with the constructivist artwork and attitudes that he had absorbed as a student. Um, this kind of grand staircase kind of bisects the rectangular plan of the building um, in a fashion that it kind of recalls the the Sitsky poster that we looked at earlier, and these kind of diagonal geometries and intersections with kind of regular orders is something that recurs in the artwork that he was interested in, and it also starts to recur in his own work. And so not long afterwards, he's given his first kind of opportunity to indulge all of these various interests. Um, a friend of his from the Warsaw days, John, John Ginsburg, is, um, <coughs> is asked by his father to propose an apartment building for a tight kind of parcel wedged between two neighboring buildings um, in the 16th arrondissement in Paris. And the, the, the two architects kind of propose this, this building, um, which is 18 apartments uh, split over, two, over nine floors. And here it is under construction, and the, you can see the beams was concrete, the beams spanning between the glossy walls, which I think was illegal at the time. And so the plan is arranged in this kind of very um, deliberately unequal hierarchy between a two bedroom apartment facing the street, so at the bottom of this drawing, and a, a very small studio facing the, this, this um, courtyard at the back of the site. So this. Um, it's kind of ingenious in a few ways, I suppose. The first being that the staircase is uh, an open lift shaft, and uh, a kind of secondary service elevator runs in this this little shaft that's highlighted here. And uh, the beckon kind of borrows light from the courtyard into the into the volume of the staircase to you know provide a kind of even natural light on every on every level. Here it is from the street, kind of adheres to some of the tropes, I suppose, of the of what was the international style. So this kind of monolithic expression that's kind of um, accentuated in the detailing of the sills and um, some of the finer, the finer components like the windows. And this is a drawing in detail, cutting through the these kind of very extravagant widescreen sash windows, both of which actually slide down into a pocket 
that's integrated into the wall, so they effectively disappear. And Mies um, had recently kind of perfected this at the the Tuita. He also enters the Palace of Soviets competition um, with a couple of friends, and it's a kind of synthesis of the influences that he's been absorbing up to this point. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of rigorously symmetrical plan that's kind of bisected by these um, uh, wedge-shaped administrative wings. So there's an auditorium on the left-hand side for about 15,000 people, and the secondary one on the, on the right-hand side, with the library in the center and these wing administration offices um, either side. He doesn't win. Uh, the competition descends into a bit of a shambles. Uh, there are rounds and rounds of redesigned uh, adjustments to the brief, adjustments to the program, and Stalin kind of gets more um, involved over the course of the competition. And this, this is the final design by Boris Yodham, which was eventually um, abandoned after Stalin had added the statue of Lenin to the top and doubled the height of the structure. And I think perhaps it, it says a little bit about where mainstream cultural appetite in Russia was heading. And it was uh, <coughs> diverging somewhat from the earlier constructivist examples that Rebecca had been so excited by. So London is kind of initially the next stop on his grand tour. There's no, no stated intention of, of staying for any significant amount of time. It just so happens that he, that's what he ends up doing. And it's a city um, where the kind of industrial revolution, First World War, kind of fading into the rear view when he arrives. I mean, um, I'm just going to flick through some of the types that sort of define the city at the moment that he arrives. So it's kind of squalid. Um, Industrial workers' housing captured by Dore. Um, interestingly, in 1930 or 31, when Lebeckin arrived, it was the same year that um, workhouses were out. So, you know, the <coughs> beginning of Oliver Twist, where you know this is where the poor and destitute would live. It feels feels longer ago than it was, but it was the same year. And these would have been dotted around the city along with uh, Rose and Georgian terraces, <coughs> tenement blocks kind of failed experiments in high-rise living for the most part, mansion blocks, and what was, a, what was effectively in its infancy, which was um, the kind of uh, <coughs> state bills, council, public housing. So this is one of the first examples, it's not far from here, it's the Boundary Estate, and this is the Arnold Circus before all the trees were mature. And it's obviously the interwar period, so the First World War is about 15 years prior, and a lot of money and energy are spent in developing this typology of, of suburban um, housing. Uh, the Lloyd George, uh, David Lloyd George, who was Prime Minister, had promised. Homes fit for heroes for soldiers who returned. Um, state built housing was kind of accelerating bit by bit, as well as um, other experiments in um, kind of mid rise tenant housing like here in Lewisham. So almost as soon as he arrives, he sets up these. This is the Beckham. Um, the older gentleman, along with six AA graduates. Um, among them are uh, Francis Skinner and Douglas Bailey, who he will practice with more or less throughout his professional life, and a very young Dennis Lasden, who will go into other things eventually. And one of their first kind of major commissions is this it's a series of um, zoo buildings for the London Zoo. And Lebetkin's kind of um, interest in, in amenity and quality of life that he had 
first started to explore in the Paris apartment building, for example, with the windows that we looked at, kind of uh, developed a little bit further, maybe a bit ironically for animals rather than people, but it develops all the same. This is a, a gorilla enclosure at the London Zoo, um, which is kind of arranged as two kind of hemispheres. And what's interesting and ingenious about it is, um, much like the windows in Paris, the um, enclosure on the upper half of the drawing can be um, sealed off or opened up by a series of movable folding screens that, that appear and disappear depending on the season. So visitors would either um, come in the summer and <coughs> look on the gorillas from the outside, or in the winter they would enter the enclosure and view the bottom line coming in here. And this is a, a collaboration with um, Ogar, one of many, and Arab was a, was a kind of singular uh, genius, I suppose, in developing and pushing forward the technology of reinforced concrete in Britain. And these are uh, brave guys giving it a go, I suppose. It's incredible uh, formwork that uh, appears gradually. So here you can see it in the open configuration. People would have kind of stood uh, here. Here it is close. Interior. The next project is the one that I think really kind of puts him on the map. It, it, it becomes enormously popular and it kind of catapults Lubeckian and Arab to fame in their respective fields. It's a penguin pool, again at the London Zoo. And I suppose much like the Soviet's palace competition, it, it started to synthesize a lot of the Beckins influences. Um, this kind of symmetrical, ovular plan is it's complicated and uh, enriched by this diagonal geometry of intersecting spiral ramps at the center in a kind of, uh, maybe kind of ocular. And these are just some studies of Rebecca trying to, to try to work this out. And he was a rigorous kind of tester of ideas throughout his career. He can draw things dozens, if not hundreds, of times before getting them right. And Arab devised this really ingenious kind of um, shuttering and reinforcement to the ramps in this kind of, kind of spiral ball configuration that um, allowed them to be stiff enough to hold their own weight, and the Beckham kind of pushed him above and beyond um, in his kind of keenness to have the leading edge of the ground facing outward, so along here, be thinner than the leading edge of the inside. So the, the, the eventual pass concrete is, is three inches on the, on the outside and six on the inside. And here's Arab looking very pleased with himself. And it just, you end up with this really kind of theatrical um, space, really. Um, it's a simple enclosure, a pool, a diving tank, uh, a shelter, a free soleil in the top left corner of the village. Um, but it really became kind of a poster child for the modern movement in, in Britain. It's hard to tell how small this building really is. So see that little penguin. <laughs> the meteor kind of project arrives soon after. Um, the Beckin is introduced to the Gestetner family, who run a successful kind of office equipment supplier company. And um, they ask him initially to make some designs for 60 apartments <coughs> for their staff. Um, it doesn't end up like that, but that's how it was designed. And it's a site in what is, I think, the ninth highest 
point in London. So it's a site overlooking Ham City Heath in Highgate. So prominent, as prominent as they, as they come, I think. Uh, with uh, Ham City Heath up to the bottom of the center. And this is the site before the Vatican. back in. And the building arrives. Um, and it owes a bit of a debt, I suppose, to the visit Jean Voisin, it's kind of crucial for um, plan arrangement. And also to Corbusier in the uh, kind of adoption of what was what he called the promenade architecture, um, where you would kind of arrive in your motor car on the right hand side of the image under the porch, and you would sort of wend your way through this luxurious um, foyer and beyond to the garden, and the site is kind of gently sloping towards Ham City. So just kind of a few images of that journey. Uh, it's another kind of case study in monolithic uh, concrete articulation. And you see a few images of how that was made, which is really quite spectacular, and approaching from the street. And the building is on Pilotti, another kind of Corbusier inspiration, approaching to the, to the porch on the right hand side. Through the, the foyer, which is kind of theatrically lit and arranged, and emerging into the garden. And so the plan is just two apartment types uh, rotated around two central cores, so there's eight flats per core. And once again, the, the He's up to the same game as he had tried in Paris, where each stair tower is an open lift shaft. The lifts are going up and down here. And two of the corners of the, of the tower are uh, clad in glass blocks, which borrow lights into the center of the plan via some of these drying balconies to the apartments. Diagram explaining that. The flats themselves are, are simply but um, really elegantly arranged. Uh, Arik once again uh, collaborates with the Vetkin, and the central kind of downstand theme, which runs top to bottom of both of these plans, is both a kind of spatial tool, and um, but both one that's kind of suppressed. So living accommodation is to one side, sleeping to the other. And the structural downstand that keeps some of the slab depths thinner uh, is concealed within a, a storage, a line of storage of bedrooms. That's to both the um, big and the small flats, both of which balconies and really quite kind of quite um, panoramic views and you know, triple aspects. It's kind of universally good views in this, in this block thanks to its plan form. And another kind of spectacular um, innovation, I suppose, in with the an approach to window, which uh, is one of the one of the ways in which Beckin tackles the, the problem of high rise living, I suppose, in Britain, which is something that wasn't being attempted much at this point in time. It's something he had experience on, like many architects practicing in Europe, but this really became something of a, of a case study for Britain. Uh, it was. Again, widely published, usually popular, visited by um, architects of renown from Europe and from America. Um, Corbusier called it an achievement of the first rank. Uh, and it helped further kind of progress the career of the Vetkin and of Tecton. Um, 
This is a drawing um, showing the kind of innovative shuttering technique. So these, these on the right-hand side, these um, independent columns gradually lift this um, timber shuttering. And the timber shuttering is kind of unequal in section such that the, the um, walls and the slab can be cast in a monolithic um, pore, which strengthens all the joints between floor and wall and reduces the structural depths throughout. Um, so it's a really kind of incredible way of building, and it's a way of building that um, frees the site from scaffolding, because this thing just gradually goes up and up and up. And you could cast um, one floor and three pores, which is quite amazing. And here it is under construction. So he convinces the Gestetners to buy a plot of land next door. Um, and high point two is the building that emerges. So there's a, it's a, a linear block that kind of follows the, one of the legs of the cruciform from high point one along with some lower garage buildings uh, along the downhill. <coughs> Here they are together. Um, you'll probably note there's a, a, a difference in kind of expression between the two. Um, high point one has this monolithic expression with these punched openings. And high point two is a mixture um, of the same and a kind of infill um, articulation which boils down to the, the, the structure that's proposed in terms of the high, The first building um, obviously attracts a lot of praise, but it attracted a lot of criticism as well, um, mostly from neighbors who felt that it was detracting from the character of the area. And um, under the recently introduced uh, Town and County Planning Act, they were able to have a significant kind of impact on the design for this building. So, Gestetner was in a bit of a tricky situation because he was limited to building 16 flats uh, on a site that he had spent more than twice the money on as the previous one. So, the Beckin was forced somewhat into designing apartments that would attract kind of return on investment for the family. So these are, very, these are incredibly luxurious apartments. Um, we'll get to the plan in a moment, but the, the, the apartments in the center um, feature a kind of double height living, living area, and that along with a few of the other requirements um, have Arif design a combination of this monolithic construction to the wings and a uh, infill concrete frame to the center and that, that generates the kind of language that's articulated on the facade. Um, ground floor plan kind of accentuates, I suppose, the emphasis on the dwellings themselves as opposed to the communal space um, between them. This kind of boomerang shaped foyer leads directly into um, lifts that open either side straight into apartments. And most of the ground floor is, is uh, dedicated to rooms for servants and maids. So the kind of people that work for the buyers of this type of apartment. And tradesmen and um, be able to read and servants have their own dedicated lift and their own dedicated step. So it's a, it's a bit of a, a far cry from, um, I suppose, the, the Russian Revolution. And so there, there are four bedroom apartments, or five if you count the study, um, on both in the center and on the wings. Um, eat the central apartments have this double height living space in the center of the semicircular stair that connects 
two levels of these, of these maisonettes, so it's a series of, of, of maisonettes. And I enjoy this kind of progress of going up to the east choice. <coughs> and here they are together, and you, it's maybe worth saying as well that Beckham was, um, was growing frustrated even only a few years later with he called the aesthetic bankruptcy of the international style um, and the anonymity that it kind of imposed. And, um, I suppose he took his frustrations out um, in the design for the canopy that, that, that uh, projects out of the ground floor, um, where he convinced the British Museum to um, sell him two casts of these Greek caryatid uh, figures um, who sit underneath the canopy and who you know, have these uh, built-in rainwater pipes, but who are actually not structural, so you'll see they're missing from the other side. And the Beckham referred to them as, as, um, as garden ornaments, and this set off a kind huge debate in the uh, uh, architectural discourse at the time, I suppose, and uh, that's no doubt it pissed off his neighbors as well. And lots of Sumerians in the palace as well? Sorry? Yeah, lots of Sumerians in the palace. <coughs> it was quite sophisticated. It was a while ago. And um, here he is. takes on a few kind of different expressions as you move around it. It's quite interesting. Um, this is the kind of main entrance of the building. You, you, you proceed by this kind of processional arch, uh, I'm sorry, into the, the main door. And um, it has this, this, this vast kind of screen of, of glass blocks um, as a foyer And the building is finished in these uh, Faience tiles to base into this kind of tablet church. And then the, the facades that kind of adjoin terraced housing have this you know, measured articulation um, in Thermalux curtain wall, um, curtain walling uh, that Becky said would shimmer like a girlfriend's hair. Finally, the, the lecture theatre, which is at the back of the building, has this sort of tapered form and it sort of becomes a building in its own right. Um, and the building is kind of ruthlessly simple in its organization, again, to try to make it as clear as possible to its uh, occupants, to its visitors. Um, so the public facing areas are arranged ground floor, either side of this uh, kind of generous foyer with the, the staff and offices and other facilities at the top. And you can see that the, I mean, it's a kind of H-shaped plan of the, this generous foyer in the center, and wings of, of Phoenix and consulting rooms either side. The wings are sort of splayed and, and detached from the volume <coughs> of the foyer in such a way that as you move from outside to whichever consultant or, or doctor you're visiting, your, your journey is kind of consistently and um, well lit by daylight. And the same is true of the, the upstairs. And he kind of uses the more luxurious materials in the palette in the areas where the public will look at and touch them the most. So um, the kind of faience tiling here is, is complemented by this, this bronze uh, entrance door, which is a marble surround. Uh, it's sort of kind of unusually unfamiliar in its, in its luxury to what was here before. 
and he wanted the foyer itself to, to have the kind of ambiance of the, of the club. Um, so he, you know, he even went to the point of having this beautiful furniture by Palmer Alto, um, which is no longer there, unfortunately. And he, he kind of um, referred arguably to, to some of the kind of agile prop that he had seen as a, as a young man in kind of commissioning these murals by um, Gordon Miller, which advocated further for the, kind of, uh, the, the, the goals of the Borough Council, so uh, exercise, natural light, um, time outdoors. And these are expressed in the, the mural, as you see. And these are just a few examples of, of the integration Structure and services, so there was heating in the, in the heating um, heating paths in the ceilings, and kind of dado trunking for cabling and services um, to the interior along the perimeter of the building, and um, plumbing that was integrated into the uh, thermolux curtain walling. And it was one of the first um, curtain walls that was built in London, actually. And it was it was um, intended as the first of a series of buildings and projects by the borough that would tackle its kind of deprivation. It was completed in uh, 1938, which was shortly before the Second World War broke out. So. Unfortunately, most of this plan for Finsbury was was put on hold. And some of these some of these projects, um, the Spa Green Estate, for example, would be picked up again after the war, but in kind of modified form. Um, so it's it's kind of remarkable that the building is chosen um, along with a few other examples. This promotional campaign by Abram um, Games, who was the official uh, war poster artist um, in the Second World War. There are a few variants of this poster, um, some are kind of more rural in their character, but I think it, it goes a long way to, to show the, the appetite for this kind of this, 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 this bear, this type modernity expert. And this is a, a down German bomber outside Bittenbury Town Hall. And you know, as we all know that this was the, the Blitz where, where London was pretty heavily bombed and the Betkin kind of continued his collaboration with the Borough Council but um, dedicated his energy during wartime to the design of um, air raid shelters. So this is a circular helical structure, a bit like an underground car park that he designed um, to sit deep on the ground and provide shelter from, from bombing. And you can see his kind of rhetorical skills put to a slightly more grim use in um, advocating for improved safety further on the ground. And he was, you know, he, was, he was ever the kind of entertainer. Here he is um, showing off the concept on TV. And it becomes kind of hugely popular as an idea. Um, it's kind of published in the national newspapers and discussed kind of widely, uh, specifically this design for Finsbury. Um, to the point where a kind of proposal report ends up on Churchill's desk. And, um, for all of its kind of uh, benefits, it it is kind of very ambitious and very expensive, and Churchill kind of shelves it, um, much to the dissatisfaction of many. So this is a cartoon on the left hand side in the Daily Express, um, where this guy is being chastised by his kind of 
bombshells are the woman on the left is, is heading off to Finsbury, I'm sure you say. I suppose the Becky was vindicated to an extent in the kind of surge towards the underground stations um, each night where people would kind of buy two tickets and sleep underground um, to try and stay safe. And he was sort of dejected by the you know, Churchill's lack of enthusiasm for his project for his, his project and he was slightly too old to join um, service as a as an engineer or, or, or something like that. So he joined the land army and, and became a farmer and produced goods. Uh, and many of his staff at Tecton being slightly younger than him, had gone to join the engineers or the fire service or gone abroad. Um, and the war effectively spelled out the dissolution of Tecton. Um, he would regroup with Skinner and Bailey and his kind of post-war projects were completed under that name. Um, the first, the Spa Green Estate, um, Again, for the borough of Finsbury, was one that was designed before the war, but um, kind of act of national reconstruction following the extensive bombing campaign and the sort of disarray that the country found itself in. You know, and, you know, uh, for too many reasons to list, um, meant that designs that were tabled before the war were kind of heavily modified. So. For example, the uh, Atlee Labour government had swept away Winston Churchill. Um, there were new standards for um, housing and government, centralised government bodies for um, reconstruction, which dictated a lot of adjustments to several of his designs. Uh, so, kind of most notably for this project, it was um, it kind of halved the proposed accommodation to. Half as many kind of occupants as were designed for. So it's another site that was that was earmarked for slum clearance before the war, and kind of uh, partially bombed. And um, there's a there's a small spa main park on the left hand side, and uh, South as well as theatre uh, as well. And Lekin responds with these three uh, linear. Blocks. Um, the two on the, on the bottom are um, eight stories and they frame a kind of plaza, and then a lower block sort of in a kind of S shape uh, responds to the slightly unusual boundary to the east. And, and it's another collaboration with Arab who um, was responding to the criteria of the post-war period in um, proposing a new kind of economical, robust, uh, reinforced concrete structure, which you might know as cross wall, or you might know as box frame, or eggshell, where internal walls and floors um, are cast in reinforced concrete, and the envelope is uh, typically brick to add stiffness and uh, create a line of insulation to the perimeter. And here's, here it is under construction. It, it invites a kind of um, different response to making facades from the Beckin, who kind of returns to his childhood fascination with carpets and his kind of time under Boringer. Um, he settles on the on the checkerboard, which he sticks with for the remainder of his career as a kind of what he considers appropriate um, articulation of um, a whole that's greater than the sum of its parts and that kind of suppresses the individual or in many of his buildings, the individual <coughs> dwelling. Um, so these are studies of the, of the park facades at Spa Green and the buildings completed. Uh, and 
it's a, it's a mixture of, of kind of <coughs> brick piers with uh, balconies clad in balconies and uh, kind of cornices clad in uh, ceramic tile. The apartment plans are kind of consistent from floor to floor, but the detailing of the balconies creates a kind of rhythm that obscures the legibility of the, of the internal arrangement. But meanwhile, the facades facing the plaza, are, are, which are all bedrooms, are um, more kind of demure uh, in their expression. And this, this approach that he takes of you know, um, distinctly uh, different uh, expressions to facades on either side of the building is something that is a game that he continues to play and kind of ramp up. Lower building, which uses the same materials. So, to one side, you have this, this kind of play in uh, material and uh, depth, so these, these, these brick facades pushing in and out, and these, these uh, ceramic part balconies. And on the other, you have the more simple expression of the, the gallery access. The and it's it's a similar um, similar game to the high point apartment in some ways. And uh, yet again, the, the living accommodations, the kitchens and the living rooms are split by this uh, structural line with bedrooms to the other side. <coughs> We're kind of trying to be as ruthless as possible about. You know, reducing reducing corridors and, and maximizing kind of unity. And similarly to the eight story blocks where which which as you can see I have one typical floor plan but an adjustment in uh, balconies in each alternating floor. And he's he's continuing to try to layer kind of um, additional kind of function onto Areas wherever you can. So, for example, the roof terrace in this project is finished with a, a canopy that was designed with an aerodynamics engineer to facilitate the, the drying of clothes in as, as good a way as possible. And this attention to mobility is expressed in this patch between the kitchen and the living room. And he goes on um, growing increasingly frustrated along the way with the kind of mountain of bureaucracy that stands between his pre war designs and uh, post war construction. So, the Priory Green Estate is another project that had been on the drawing board for a long time. It went from a proposed kind of 800. 20 occupants to 475, and it's a it's a similar arrangement to Spa Green with these two linear blocks facing one another across the plaza in a series of lower um, four-story gallery access buildings to the edge, as well as a, a communal laundry in this corner, and one of, another of the kind of um, cuts imposed by post-war penny pinching um, was the loss of several um, public amenities in the, in the, in the projects, including like a nursery and a pub and a library. And this was a, it was a vast estate that was uh, left in that respect. So it was a kind of heavily bombed area of terraced housing prior. And here it is in its context, and it's still you know, 20 years after um, the health center, there's still a kind of really, I suppose, palpable tension between the expression of the veterans' buildings and the context that they belong to. And so it's 
so this game of uh, differentiated <coughs> facades is, is carried one step, one step further here. Um, the linear blocks are split into three um, volumes, and each volume is identical except for its orientation facing one way or the other. So each block is, is deck accessed, and um, the, deck sits, the deck sits onto the kitchens and bathrooms, and um, in some cases, bedrooms, and then the other side of since the center here is uh, bedrooms and living rooms and balconies. And the lower blocks are playing the same game where there's this alternation in both the sides and orientation. This is the, the communal laundry in the foreground and the gallery access to. And despite some of the constraints that had really um, messed around with the, with the project's design over the course of several years, the, the, the lower blocks at least achieved this really nice, um, kind of beautifully symmetrical plan where the spaces, the living room, bedroom, uh, bathroom, and kitchen are, are kind of arranged <coughs> symmetrically around this entrance hallway. The taller buildings, at least for the three bedroom apartments, um, attempt a similar approach, and there are a few compromises along the way, um, including some bedrooms kind of oriented towards the gallery, <coughs> you know, slightly more baggy in its, in its um, circulation. And this is um, just a diagram illustrating the approach to infill in, in brick uh, to Arabs eggshell construction. So Bevin Court comes next, and it's a kind of departure from um, what in the previous two projects was an approach kind of characterized by framing space uh, in these linear blocks. So forming a plaza or and instead, Lubeckin opts to kind of um, propose a, an independent object surrounded by garden, um, which is interesting, I suppose, because the site was um, what was Holford uh, Square, which was heavily bombed during the war, and um, initial designs by Lubeckin were uh, about um, reinstating the courtyard in some form, but he eventually landed on this um, approach of a single building with these three uh, legs in a kind of white shape. And the game of, of, of alternating the sides is kind of uh, complicated and enriched a bit further here, so there are um, two-story maisonettes in the left Side um, and uh, individual one and two bedroom apartments on each floor on the right hand side. And you can kind of make out the deck access to the left hand side that's kind of suppressed in this um, elevation facing the, the, the circus nearby. Um, you can see the, the deck access along here. And then the elevation facing north away from the circus is um, dedicated to the gallery access for the one and two bedroom apartment. And in shaking off this um, this kind of previous approach, Beckin is able to return to his roots in a, in a way and, uh, and develop his, his approach further. So the center of where the, where the legs of the Y shape converge is the, is the vertical circulation, so the stair and the lift. And he ends up with this really incredible theatrical space where the column at the center of the space um, is hugged by these half landings, and the stair approaches the half landing from a different orientation on each floor. 
and every three floors it returns to this original organization. So you end up with this incredible spectacle. And once again, he's able to flood his, his stair as he had Paris, as he had in about that point. able to tighten up a bit further, I think. So he struggled previously with the veterans facing the gallery, but I think the extending of the deck in this long arrangement allows the plans to tighten up with the amazing that's just efficient. And he follows a similar approach for the Dorset estate in Bethnal Green, so Road is running along the top of the image. <coughs> and he's ever the rigorous tester, um, testing dozens of uh, you know, plans and uh, arrangements of, of buildings. And he's sort of he's, he's kind of creating a coherent architectural language, but, but subversing it in the arrangement of this of this gallery access so windows become galleries and the shadow becomes facade. And it's again a mixture of a, a, a ten-story block this time with a series of lower um, double basement buildings. And he, he has another stab with this three-step three staircase, this time without the central column, without the central to this incredible kind of Asherian Escher like <coughs> atmosphere inside. And at the, at the kind of urging of the Bethnal Green Borough Council, he's, he's convinced to add a 20 story tower, um, civil house, to the mix just a few meters down the road. And he's, he's, he's grappling again. Studies of the, the arrangement and the rhythm, the alternating um, kind of C-shaped uh, concrete panels. The plan has this kind of subtle but um, effective south-facing emphasis. So, um, one story, one bedroom apartments uh, in the northern volume, and two bedroom apartments in the southern volume. And they're they're connected once again by a stair. Bevel Court and uh, the start. And his last uh, major major project at the Cranbrook Estate um, for the Bar of Bethel Green in 1965. Um, it was uh, an area kind of earmarked for compulsory, pur compulsory purchase. Um, so quite a few people were displaced from their homes. Some were kind of offered uh, accommodation in the Cranbrook. And his proposal is a series of, of towers and, and linear blocks. And towers kind of alternate in height and orientation to form three pairs, equal uh, descending height. And you get a kind of incredible uh, variety in the, in, the, in the atmosphere of the light that catches these buildings when you visit um, because of the, the kind of subtle variety in their orientation. And here they are complete. And his, his interest in, in the checkerboard and the carpet is, is elevated by uh, this plate and leaf. So these brickwork piers are kind of undulating across the facade um, with these Yeah, 
this incredible richness of um, expression in the oblique view as the, as the, as the, as the, the alternating panels kind of intensify. Plans, you know, have these two tapering um, staircases opposite one another that use it to have typical um, window openings width to bring light into the center of the plan. And the, the scheme was initially intended to connect uh, Globe Town to Victoria Park, but the borough kind of failed to uh, acquire the final parcel. Uh, the veterans have lost artistic <coughs> gestures that uh, convey uh, a bit of landscape. So, as you approach, it's meant to kind of signify a uh, disappearing, vanishing point. And just very briefly, um, <coughs> I suppose the veterans' career kind of concludes at the moment um, that. London and Britain's uh, appetite for um, public housing starts to uh, diminish. Um, it's for many reasons that it took another session to go through by someone other than me, but I suppose among them are um, the rise of uh, cheap and uh, precast construction, um, where large contractors were able to build cheaply for local authorities and put up huge social housing very quickly. One such example was the uh, Freemasons Estate um, in Newham, which was completed in 1968 and uh, only a few weeks afterwards um, suffered a, a partial progressive collapse to the corner when a gas explosion um, blew out the, the junction between the floor and the slab and it walled and went tumbling down. And it created a, a significant kind of backlash against um, this, this, this form of construction um, in turn to this, this form of, kind of um, publicly procured housing. There's only one family who, who decided to move back once it had been reconstructed, and it was eventually demolished in, in the mid 80s. And simultaneously, um, Margaret Thatcher introduced the right to buy um, in 1979, which um, allowed social housing tenants to buy their, their accommodation at a heavily discounted rate, and it kind of reduced the supply of, of public housing significantly. And so the red uh, illustrates the reduction in state built housing, uh, graph on the right hand side showing the increase in house prices. And So the Vetkin is become something of a recluse. He was never much of a, a social animal. He never joined the RBA or anything like that. But he was awarded the gold medal in '82, and um, his work has, has, has <coughs> you know, survived to varying degrees of success with some projects uh, restored and, and uh, maintained much better than others. But um, what drew me to him is, I think, something that's still you know, extremely evident today, which is the kind of richness of his um, approach to facades. 